All right, guys, 30 minutes for show time. You know what we're doing? You ready to go? Do you really think Ortiz isn't going to hit 40 home runs? When did I say that? Are you, are you kidding me? Hey, guys, listen, listen. You're the leader of this team. You got to take control, all right? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Since when did they become the leaders? Who decided you were a leader? What are you saying? Haven't you only been here for like three weeks? Guys, what? concentrate. We have a show. Freshman. Hey, guys, all right? Put it together. Also, put Roy and Brandon on, all right? Yeah. All right, guys. You know what we're doing? Let's have a good show. All right, camera, Amir. Let's go. Amir. Amir. Guys, seriously, we're on in two minutes. Nico, seriously, I haven't finished my taco salad yet. Seriously, Shaki? Do you ever stop complaining? Seriously, Extra? Do you even do anything yet? I have to pee. Seriously. All right, boys. You gotta be ready for next questions. Who's ready to argue today? All right, baby, what time is it? Showtime! Showtime! Welcome to UMass Sports Weekly. As always, guys, our new Thursday afternoons as we welcome Dan Duggan, Clifford Shockett, and myself, Nick DeFelice, guys. It's really starting to get nice out. It's a little out, more so. comfortable Thursday <laughs> afternoon. Thursday I feel afternoon. better about it, you know? Two weeks in a row now, we've canned the ties, and I like the look. It's, it's a comfortable look. Looks good on you. But um, as always, guys, we got your UMass Sports on top. We got lacrosse, softball, and baseball today. We got Major League Baseball. We got NBA playoffs. We got um, a little um, NFL update and... Um, Hockey we'll course to NHL playoffs that. as well. Yeah. But um, without further ado, let's talk about UMass lacrosse, guys. They had a huge game Tuesday here at home against Fairfield. They came into the game 8-3, and three, and this is going into the Syracuse game. They needed this. Um, they needed a win here badly. So let's go to the highlights here of the UMass Fairfield lacrosse game. See head coach Canella and his troops ready for battle against Fairfield. Fairfield coming off a win against Loyola, guys. We'll talk about that in just a minute. So Fairfield coming in with a lot of energy as they took it to the Minutemen here early, going up one to nothing. They go up two nothing. We're not going to show it to you, but let's go to Recchione as he and the Minutemen attack finally get things going here in the game. Recchione's going to drive, get himself on just enough space, gets the goal off, and Fairfield still up two to one, but Minutemen attacking. Now Fairfield again. Taking it to the Minutemen, Doc Schneider saw an array of shots early in this game, but Fairfield doing a good job of being flex, uh, strong and taking it to the Minutemen defense as they go up 3-2 here. Now Fairfield, not all offense here for them. Check out this save, guys. This is one of the better saves you will see in lacrosse, as that ball couldn't tell if it was going to hit the crossbar or not. But Recchione again for the Minutemen, sitting back and getting this ball and just firing it in. Minutemen cutting the deficit now down by two. 
so later in this game, this game got better as it went along. Sean Moore is here with this goal. Minutemen down just one. So that, just a beautiful shot there by Sean Morris. That ties the game, guys. That is a game tire with just 15 seconds left here in the game. Off the faceoff, we'll show it to you live as it happened here to us. So the Minutemen attack, they take it down. Jack Dean's going to eventually get his hands on this one. And he finds just enough space and fires it in here. And the Minutemen go up now. Very few seconds left here in this game. Let's take it now from the faceoff. The very few seconds left here in this game. Fairfield attacking, gets the shot off. Doc Schneider the save, you can see the time expiring. And the Minutemen celebrate on what turned out to be an absolutely phenomenal lacrosse game. And Canella and the rest of this Minutemen team must be thrilled with this one as they head into Syracuse, guys. Here you see your final score, seven to six. And it did, it turned out to be a great game. Coming in, guys, we didn't really expect Fairfield to be you know, too much of a, uh, you know, to be this close of a game. But, Dan, talk about it. Coming into this game, what it meant for the Minutemen to pull out a W. Yeah, I mean, Fairfield came in off their biggest win of the year against Loyola, so you knew they were going to come out ready to play. But I don't think UMass expected to be held down so much. And that last minute, I mean, that's about as good a minute as lacrosse you could have. But the first 59 minutes, I think Canelo and the boys would like to forget because they really just couldn't get anything going. Took 47 shots, only found the back in that seven times. I mean, that's just frustrating. But they were able to come through when they needed to, which is huge. Yeah, in the last couple of games, you know, the offense for this team has been kind of stagnant, and you, you don't want to say it, but it really has been. Only 12, uh, tw uh, what is it, 13 goals now in the last two games, starting with that game against Georgetown where they went down 8-6, to six, but it was good to see it pick it up in the last minute of that game. And what this team always does, they always respond to adversity. You know, they always respond to the call when they're down late in games. So the Minutemen now 9-3, and 4-2 and two in the ECAC. But, Dan, what does this mean about the Minutemen offense? Is this something to be worried about here at this point in the season? I think it probably is because they started out, they came out of the gate so hot, but now they have been struggling. You said 13 goals in the last two games. I mean, they were the number three team in the country offensively coming into this week and have struggled. And it's, you know, talking to Coach Chanel, talking to Sean Mars, he's worried. Is it a little bit of confidence? Because last year they had Jeff Zawicki, so him and Mars could play off each other. No one's really stepped up and filled that void by Zawicki to be that solid number two option. So everything's on Mars. Other teams are just totally keying on him, and it just puts a lot of pressure on him. Yeah, Dan, I was just going to that you raise an excellent point as we take a look at the stats right here. Uh, uh, Fairfield at UMass. Morris, two goals, one assist on uh, nine shots. And Recky Owen with two goals. UMass, three goals in the last minute of three. But at the same time, Nick, you know, you look at this team, a lot of young kids coming in, a lot of freshmen and sophomore players. They're not used to this type of play down the stretch. So uh, this team is heavily relying on Morris as it comes down late in the games and late in the season. They don't really have a strong number two option as they did last year with a lot of veteran players. So the further into the season you go, the better the schedule gets. The Minutemen had Georgetown, Fairfield, now Syracuse. Well, guys. Better for who? Better for us to watch? Better for, yeah. I, I mean, it, it's a tough schedule and they knew that coming in. Anytime you're in the ECAC, it's going to be tough. But let's go back to that Georgetown game, guys. And what happened in that Georgetown game? It was such a close game, Dan. What, you know, what happened to the Minutemen? Well, it's kind of the problem that's been plaguing them lately. They haven't been able to finish. They had their chances. I mean, they got down early, but Sean Mars put on a show in that third quarter. Hattrick in that period alone brought the Minutemen back. But they just couldn't get over that hump to tie the game. And then, you know, once it's a tie game, anything can happen. But they just couldn't get They ran into a hot goalie, and they just couldn't get anything going offensively. And that's really been the story in these last two games. Yeah, I think they just put themselves way too much of a hole in the, in the first half there against Georgetown. Normally, what we've seen out of this team is they've come firing out of the gate. They like to establish the tone early, and the Minutemen were not able to do that against Georgetown last weekend. And that really just put themselves in a bad spot heading into the second half. They made a nice little run there at the end, but Syracuse, the late goal, able to hold on. You mean Georgetown with the late goal? You I saw that. Me, um, yes. You saw the stats from that game. The Minutemen came into that game ranked number eight in the nation, taking on number seven Georgetown. Of course, now falling to number eleven. But let's go back to the Fairfield game, guys. They had the early struggles, but then the veterans were able to carry it out. Some of those stats from that game, it's interesting. I mean, Morris took the team on his back. And Jack, De Jake Dean, they they really rallied to go. So, what can we look for going into this Syracuse game? Well, that's really been a key for them all year. They have a strong group. I mean, they got the three captains and Jack Reed, Jake Dean, Sean Mars. They've led the team all year. But when you look at that last minute, it's those three and Brian Jacobini, another senior, and they stepped up, took the team on the back, and just wouldn't let them lose that game. I mean, the younger guys have chipped in, but when it comes right down to it, those are the guys that Canella and the team is going to look to, and they've done a great job leading the team. What I like about this team is that, you know, you look at the end of this game and you see the shots that they fired. They weren't shots just, you know, on a whim taking the shots. This UMass team, their offense is patient and they wait for the right opportunity. They do a great job of working the ball around the perimeter and they really do sit on their offense waiting for the opportunity that they want and usually they're able to get it. 
So Miniman beat Syracuse last year here on Garber Field. Now going to the Carrier Dome, it's a completely different atmosphere. Now, what do you think the Minutemen need to do early? Do they need to sit back and take Syracuse's attack or take it right to them as they did in the final minutes there against Fairfield? I think you absolutely need to come out and take it to them. That's one of the things I've been talking about this week is playing loose. At whatever they're not scoring, just go out there and play. Don't think about it. And with Syracuse, I mean, they can put up numbers, but you have to feel good about the way UMass's defense has played lately. They've been holding teams down. If the offense can ever catch up, then they're really going to be in business. But so I think offensively, they need to just loosen up, just go back to playing the word early in the year, and uh, everything will probably work out fine there. And defensively, just keep doing what they've been doing. Yeah, I mean, you look at this Minutemen team, every single time that they come on early and come on strong, they usually win the game when they score goals in the first period. So, you know, they're seeking for their first ever win inside the carrier zone. It's going to be a tough task, but if the Minutemen offense is able to get rolling early, I'm sure their defense will be there, as it always has been this entire season. All right, fans, of course, tune in next week as we will recap the Georgetown game in, I'm, not, I'm sorry, not Georgetown, the Syracuse game in almost its entirety. But, fans, we also remind you to call in 5 one 3 3 National if you television want to talk once about again this week. Of course, yes, another ESPNU game. So, fans, we remind you to call in 5 one 3 3 3 6 2 3 isn't it? one 3 3 6 as we switch gears now to UMass Baseball, guys. UMass Baseball had their second chance in two years to go play at Fenway Park. This year it was for the consolation game against Northeastern. They got smoked by BC in the first game. Coming off three wins going into this game, guys, what did you expect? Well, you know, coming into this game, the Minutemen obviously had to get a good starting pitching job, and it was a rough day for Mike Takata. It was his first ever start, in uh, his first ever collegiate start, and, you know, he kept the Minutemen in the game, but at the same time, you cannot give up five walks to the opposing team. I think some of that might even be attributed to the nerves of playing at Fenway Park. I mean, these kids have grown up watching the Red Sox, and then you get out there, and maybe it's, it's tough to adjust, right, you know, your first time out on Fenway Park. All right, guys, before we say too much more about that, let's take a look at some of the highlights here from this game as UBC TV 19 was there covering it. So there you see a historic Fenway Park. It, it turned out to be a pretty good day, a pretty warm 70-degree day. As you see Mike Takata there coming into this game with a 5.09 ERA. Nothing to brag about, but here or in the early going, Takata forced a bunch of ground ball outs here early in this game. He really settled in, and he looked all right as there Takata gets over and covers the bag. Takata... Not an overpowering pitcher, but this good off-speed pitch gets him the strikeout. And then the Huskies and their offense come alive. Tamlin, this kid had a huge game. Here's one of his two doubles. And this fall fielded by Muncie in left field. And we have a play at the plate. And he is gunned out. Guys, take another look at this one. Just a beautiful job of covering the plate was Pat Garrity. Here in the later innings, Pro Yeti able to steal second base. Gets himself in a scoring position with one out. He gets over to third base on a ground out, and then Pat Garrity finds a hole on the right side of the infield for this RBI single. Minutemen still trailing in this game. Here is the ninth inning, top of the ninth. We have a leadoff walk to McDonald. And then third baseman Joe Catone bloops this ball just out of the reach of the second baseman. First and second, nobody out. Minutemen electing to go to the bunt. Here's Muncie as he drops it down just out of the reach of the pitcher, and it's going to be a close play at first, and Muncy beats it out, so we got bases loaded, guys, bottom of the ninth, and nobody out, a double play, erases the infield, and gets us one run, and this is how your game ends. Ryan Franzik, who had a good day, lines out to center field, and that's your final 7-6. Minutemen made it interesting in the late innings, but do fall 7-6 to the Huskies, guys. Let's talk about just the fact that they played in Boston in and, and this huge spotlight against Northeastern. I mean, do you guys think that had an effect on the Minutemen great? Or, I mean, are both teams in the same boat there where they're affected? I think you saw it in the beginning of the game. You know, both teams came, came out a little bit edgy, a little bit, you know, a little bit hesitant, a little bit inconsistent. But then the, both pitchers were able to settle down after a few innings. The batters looked a lot more comfortable in the later innings of the game. And, you know, as the game went on, they just they looked a lot more comfortable. Right. I mean, UMass has a lot of young players, so I'm sure initially it was, you know, pretty nerve-wracking playing Fenway, but once, yeah, once the ball's in play, I'm sure everything kind of settled down, especially for the batters. All right, guys, we were all there. As, you know, we saw the game in its entirety. Let's talk about some of the things that happened here against the Minutemen. What, you know, why did we lose? What yeah, was yeah. it? Nick, you, you asked the question of why did we lose. You know, we saw the, uh, the late rally there in the bottom of the ninth inning, bases loaded with nobody on, but, you know, you and I were calling the game, and there were, the Minutemen had a lot of mental mistakes in that game. As we saw in the sixth inning, they had a rally going with a runner on, f uh, runner on first and second with nobody out, and one of them gets gunned out at third base, another one gets caught tagging on, an out, on a very short fly to the outfield. So these are base running mistakes that you cannot afford to do, and then another situation was two outs and a runner on, and uh, Mark Delray uh, goes for a stolen base on a terrible pitch, and he got you know, it was out by 30 feet, as you said in the broadcast. That's in an inning where yeah. we got the, you know, got a run, too, yeah. so it ended the inning. 
So, you know, just in, in total, the Minutemen just made bad base running mistakes, and they probably would have put a lot more runs on the board if they were able to keep the guys on the bases. Right, that's what you say. Mental mistakes are going to kill you every time. And if you run into outs, you prevent big innings, and that's really what seemed to cost them against PC. Yeah, we ran into two outs in that Northeastern game Northeastern, in that one inning, too. Yeah. And, and it was in a big inning. We ended yeah. up scoring in that inning. Yeah, first we rallied to get a runner on second with nobody out, and then he was called out at third base, and then we rallied to get a runner on first and second with nobody out, with one out, and then the runner on first was called out. All right, guys, it's a tough break there for the Minutemen as they were coming off a three-game winning streak against St. Louis. They're now 7-8 and eight in the ECAC, in the Atlantic 10, I'm sorry. Guys, now, they're seventh place in their division. Only six make it. What are they going to need to do to uh, get themselves into the playoffs? Well, right now, you know, in the, earlier in the season, we were saying the offense and, and the offense and the pitching wasn't there. Now it's a case where the offense actually is clicking. They scored 10 runs yesterday against BC in a heartbreaker, losing 12 innings. And then two days ago, as we saw, they scored six runs against Northeastern. So now they just need solid starting pitching. And right now, nobody's been able to provide that. Mitch Eilenberg yesterday against BC, seven runs, giving up seven earns. Uh, he's mm. Seven innings, giving up seven earned runs. I mean, he went deep into the game, which is something the Minutemen needed desperately there. So. Yeah, but if you're going deep and giving up all these runs, how's that helping your team? Yeah. Right, I mean, you look at the record, they've obviously played better in the conference schedule, so you hope that they can fare well in these last couple of conference games and maybe sneak into that last spot for the uh, conference tournament. All right, guys, so of course next week we'll talk to you guys about what happens here in this week. But let's move to the um, women's softball. On a roll, 28-13, and 13, guys. Let's talk about some of the freshmen and what they've done in this team, Cliff. Well, first of all, they finally got a loss. They finally got lost, now they're back on a four game winning streak, but how about Malika? Malika's actually sens absolutely sensational. Last week we were talking about how she already broke the RBI record at UMass in the middle of the season, and now this week she just broke the all-time freshman record for home run. She's been absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I mean, to come out as a freshman and stop breaking records, and these aren't small records. I mean, UMass has some great hitters through the past, so to come in and be able to break those records, that really says a lot about what she's been able to do in her first year. So these women can hit the ball, and of course, breaking records, and that's just amazing, and Dan, as you said it. But they Dayton, the next opponent here for the, uh, the Minute Women, what do they need to do to stay on top? Starting pitching, and Skull comes out of Brenda Balschmitter. She's 21-7 and seven now. With unbelievable with an ERA of still less than 1.5. She's been fantastic the entire season, and they still have that great one-two punch with herself and Jenna Busa. Yeah, to see Busa as the number two starter behind a freshman, that's not a bad number two option to have. And I mean, Balschmitter has been amazing as a freshman, so yeah, if they keep that going, they make the plays and the hit, I mean, they're going to be right there. All right, guys, that's going to do it here for us. We thank Dan Duggan, of course, from the Collegian joining us today. We will go to break right now, but when we come back, Major League Baseball is on deck. UBC TV 19, because it will give you great experience when you go into the real world. Uh, UBC is a great place to learn how to shoot video and to edit your programs and air them on the campus network. UBC is great because we have the most outstanding equipment on campus. UBC rocks the sauce because you can record anything, and I mean anything. Here at UBC TV 19, we get things done on time. People should come down to UBC to learn how to make their own TV programs and be a part of television history. People should join UBC because it's fun and you experience things that you'll never experience at any other college TV station. UBC is awesome because you get to meet famous people. So what are you waiting for? Come visit us online and find out more information about how you can join UBC TV 19, UMass's only student-run TV station. Oh, they're 12. Yeah, we're back oh, here on UMass work. Sports Weekly. Hey. Cliff, we kind of, we got to cut you off. I'm sorry, it's time <laughs> to start the show. We welcome Rory Hart in to join Clifford Shock and myself, Nick DeFelice, guys. Of course, it's, it's spring, it's baseball season. Of course, the rec Red Sox record, which we're still trying to figure out. What do we think? Thirteen and eight. You know, they're, they're one game eight. up in the Definitely division. Definitely thirteen and something. <laughs> <laughs> they're one game up in the division again, uh, up on Toronto. But of course, last night suffering the very tough loss. Cleveland dominated. Another lefty killing the Red Sox. Cliff Lee. Cliff Lee. Mm -hmm. and you like him because of his first That's name. That's right. <laughs> but um, nonetheless, the Minute uh, Minutemen, I'm still stuck here. The Red Sox, though, struggled. They didn't get anything really going offensively. The only run came off a of Willie Mopena yeah. home run, guys. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about the struggles there in Cleveland and what's well, going on. First of all, I'm glad to see Willie Mopena has been a home run when uh, Bronson Arroyo is 4-0. Uh, <laughs> we'll get to that in a he minute. He finally caught up to yeah. Bronson Arroyo in the home run total. <laughs> yeah. It's also last good night. to see No, Willie he's not. <laughs> Arroyo's got two. Oh. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, no got a second it, last It's night. also good to see Willie Mopena hitting a home run in a meaningful game. Oh, uh, oh. <laughs> but besides that, you know, we could talk about the struggles of this 
per one particular game, but at the same time, Manny Ramirez has woken up. On this road trip, seven for 16, and that's the important thing. You know, you're gonna have your losses here and there. Red Sox, tough stretch right now, four out of six, they've lost in the last six games. But, you know, this team's starting to come together. As a team, they're starting to click, minus Alex Gonzalez, and Manny's, Manny's been playing better. Um, yeah, I think all you need is some run support for Wakefield, please. That's He's not getting any. And, you know, five runs last night, but only three were earned, so he didn't even have that bad of a start. He didn't right. have that bad of a start, but let's talk about the guy catching him, Josh Bard. Yeah. How much of an adventure has Josh oh. Bard been behind the plate? It's been tough to watch. He has, I ten. believe last year, ten he had ten pass balls, balls six from Mirabelli all year last year. And Bard career had six coming in, and now he's already almost doubled his yeah. career. Just goes to show season. how hard it is to catch knuckleballs. I mean, that ball, for those of you who don't know, it literally... It flutters. I mean, that's it, it just flies through yeah. the air. And I had a friend who threw one in high school, and his was not nearly an, as good as Wakefield's, and I struggled severely yeah. with it. But um, it's it's definitely a heck of a job. But now we're thinking about it. You know, Mirabelli's gone. He's now the backup in We took him for Diego. granted. We took it for granted, exactly. But another guy, the Red Sox, are missing Bronson Arroyo. Let's talk about him. 4-0. and oh. yeah. As we just mentioned, Willie Mopena just caught up to him in the home run total. I mean, do but the Red Sox is that wish trade? Yeah. Is that trade making sense right now, guys? You know, I don't know. I mean, right now the starting rotation looks pretty solid, but at the same time, you, I, I never am one to advocate of trading solid starting pitching. A guy who's been proven, he was there winning your world championship with you. He came into the bullpen whenever he, whenever you needed him. He was a starter when you needed him. He did anything you wanted. He never complained. And you know, the Red Sox just re-upped his deal for three years, fifteen million dollars. You know, I, I guess they looked at him as an expendable, you know, seeing it, but now David Wells is breaking down. I wouldn't have done that trade because I just hate giving away solid starting pitching when you're getting a guy back who really has had maybe one, two solid good seasons. But, but you know, he's 24. But he's, he is 20. But how old is Bronson Arroyo? Bronson Arroyo is late 20s, you're right. Yeah. I, I, think, I think it was a good decision to trade Bronson Arroyo. I, I don't think we really had a spot for him. That's why he's gone. I think Willie Mo Pena, he's not playing every day, he's not comfortable yet. We're looking to get him into the into the lineup every day, and once we do, I think you know he's going to start getting well, some hits. Also, and bringing in Payne and Cliff, neither one of you mentioned it. Trot Nixon's a free agent after this year, yeah. right? So and they're, they're planning. You got a 24-year-old who can tear the cover yeah. off the ball. He also strikes out a million times. If they can ever close the gap on those two, maybe take some of his power away, get his average up. He'll be he'll be a starting right fielder. But in Boston. Nick, you can never ever have too much starting pitching, and that is a problem that managers and general managers absolutely love to have of a log jam in the starting pitcher position. Because hey, if one of them's not, you know, one of them, you know, you have too many guys, stick one of them in a bullpen for long relief, and still you got a guy in there that can get outs. Take a look at the Chicago White Sox last. Last year. Yep. So Arroyo, Arroyo doesn't want to be in the bullpen, though. The guy, he wants to be a starting pitcher. So I think he's happy with the situation now. And I think, I think in the long run, the Red Sox will be happy with it, too. I don't know. All right, so the Red Sox still in first place, guys. Do you think pitching is going to come back to haunt them at any point this season? You know, I, starting I, pitching? At start, you know, right, you know, we saw Beckett. He kind of came down to earth last week. Still went seven innings, you know, five runs. I thought they should have taken him out earlier in that game against Toronto immediately when he started getting in trouble. But Schilling looks like Cy Schilling right now. Beckett's great. Wakefield's solid. You know what you're going to get from him. But Clement, he's been, sh you know, Clem I don't know about Matt Clement. Matt Clement's a guy that can go up and down. He can give you eight innings, one run one day, and then four innings, eight runs the next day. Only having one inconsistent pitcher in the starting uh, rotation isn't that bad of a thing, though. I think right now our starting pitching is looking really good. Wakefield, he, he probably has the worst record in the staff right now, right? Believe, and he's, yeah. Which is you know, he's got an ERA under exactly. four. So it's what we need now is hitting. It's not. Nothing to worry about with the pitching, as long as we can stay healthy. The only thing, though, Nick, is that middle relief. I don't trust it completely. I understand you got Timlin and Papelbon, fine. But before folk. that, and you got Folk, maybe. But Cienes and the other guys, I, I don't trust it that much. Yeah, Cienes and Tavares, they, they're veterans, and they've been there before. This is Cienes' of course, second stint with the Red Sox. But Tavares, he hasn't looked... Hasn't looked like the setup man he looked like in St. Louis yeah. yet, so we're still going to have to wait around on him. But he's, he's another guy who's not old yet. He's still young, 26, 27, I believe Tavares is. So if, if we can get him and Folk going to get it to Timlin and Papelbon, I think we'll be fine, which leads us right into Papelbon. He's doing just fine, guys. Same thing. He looked a little human the other day. I like the new do, though. The Rick Vaughn do? Unbelievable. <laughs> the Ricky the wild Vaughn? Thing do. Wild the heater. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I don't know, I'm, I still don't want him as my closer. I'd, I'd like to see him pitch in 170 innings a season as opposed to 90. I think Folk, if you look at the movement on his pitches, they're ridiculous. He should be closing. I'd like to see if Pavel he's healthy. They're still I, waiting I, I, I to see if he can do I it. Completely right now, disagree. he's looking awesome. I completely disagree. Jonathan Papelbon, this is a kid whose whose job is to close. He has the attitude for it. 
starters, starting pitchers don't get haircuts like that. Those, that's a closer's attitude. You, you, know, that, that, uh, you have to have a guy who's intense, who's like a wild animal coming out of a cage in the ninth inning, and that is exactly what Jonathan Papelbon is. He hasn't given up a run yet this season. Keep him where he is. Do not take him out of this, uh, this position in the lineup because uh, the, the, the guy ripped a, he took the cannot, page right out of Schilling and Beckett's book. Every time they get a strikeout, they're pumping their fists. You can't, you can't mess thing. with this kid's mind right now. He's 25 years old, and he he settled into this closing position. Leave him there this year. I, you know, next year, two years, you want to say you want to try him out with something else, fine. This year, do not move him away from being a closer. This is what his job is this season. Good, good to see you guys agreeing on that, Tim. <laughs> but while all this is happening, there's a guy in baseball. He's 40-plus years old. He's not on the team right now. <laughs> Who? Roger Clemens, guys. Where, where can we see Roger going? The Red Sox need a starter. That's obvious. New York, Houston, is. are any of these even plausible options for Roger Clemens? I don't think he's going to New York. I think if he goes anywhere, it's going to be either Houston because he has such a sweet deal <laughs> or to the Red Sox because he wants to break that record. You know, personally, I, I actually think Houston is the odd team out in this situation. He's done it for the last two years for a full and season. And he's obviously not happy. And now. he's obviously, yeah, exactly, right. for a full season. Right now, though, you know, he has his allegiance to Joe Torre, but at the same time, he has that ability to break, uh, to, uh, to break that record in Boston and also get his number retired there. But what, I think it's going to come down to who really needs him more and who's able to guilt him more into coming back. And right now, I, I couldn't say who I think that's going to be. I would love it to be the Yankees, but I just don't know. I think yeah. right now, if he goes anywhere, it's going to be the Sox, too, because you well, would, you would it's going to be that. the Sox and <laughs> probably not Houston because if he wants to watch his little kids play baseball, then he, he just won't play. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, I mean, but this is only this point, for a half a season. At, the, yeah, this at this right, point, he right. is healthy enough. Right. He can play baseball. But I think what it comes down to right now is Houston struggling. Brad Lidge is getting teed off on right hey, now. Hey, Nomar. Little Nomar, grand slam the other day. Yeah, Nomar hit the grand slam off Brad Houston's Lidge. Houston's got Nomar, the best who? record in baseball, though. They, I mean, so <laughs> both teams are struggling. But the one team that is struggling more in the starting um, rotation out of those three the teams Yankees. is the Boston Red Sox. Well, uh, come on. They have the healthy They have the arms. Pavano's hurt still. He's Jared. never going to pitch again. Jared Wright's <laughs> in the bullpen. Give up on Pavano. I think he's done. <laughs> Look, Mussina has been great. Johnson's been okay. Chacon's been spotty. Wong's been spot. I mean, you're getting more from Chacon than you should have ever gambled for. So I, th I think if he's going anywhere, it's the Boston Red Sox. I, I, think, it's go, I think it's the Yankees. <laughs> let's let's turn around the league a little bit, guys. Let's go to the Bonds report right now. Barry Bonds, guys. He's up to three, seven, eleven. He's just three, uh, four away from the Babe. Um, let's talk about Barry Bonds, guys. What did he say last week that you thought was interesting? Do you remember what he said? I, he said should I? Aaron. He oh, said yeah, Aaron. That's right. That's right. That's right. He said that he won't. That he he doesn't think he has enough in him to pass Aaron's record. It's unlikely or something. Unlikely. Yeah. Right. Pretty yeah. happy about that. He's but just I setting just, the bar low. That's fine. I pray <laughs> to God that if Bonds breaks Babe Ruth's record, it will be on the road away from San Francisco just to hear the booze rain on him because baseball absolutely deserves a black spot or a black cloud if Barry Bonds hit, it breaks Babe, Ruth, Babe, Ruth, Babe Ruth's record, which seems inevitable right now. Yeah, so many people hate Barry, though, and it would be, I mean, pick a stadium where you'd like to see him do it. St. Louis, yeah. stadiums that really hate him yeah. that are in the baseball. He could I mean, pretty much any stadium yeah. in the National League. Yeah. It would be nice to see him do it against the Dodgers. Yeah. Some team yeah. in the same That's state. That's what I was going to say. That LA. could be brutal. <laughs> That's, of course, their rival. But Barry Bonds, 7-11, guys, stay tuned. Don't change the channel. His swing is back. He hit a bomb off oh, of Billy, Billy Wagner. Wagner. In a pinch hitting yeah, spot. Good. Yeah. 102 good. off Wagner. Yeah, that's two pinch hit home runs in the last two days. Yeah, Barry, he's, his swing is back. Whether his knee's healthy or not, his swing's there. Yeah. But, you know, who's hot, who's not right now? Chris Shelton, he's cold. Um, let's talk about the Devil, uh, the Devil Rays there. What, Gomes has now 10 home runs? Also uh, throwing bats at yeah, umpires. Yeah, throwing bats at umpires. <laughs> yeah, one of the minor leaguers there. But, uh, yeah, just a completely, you know, interesting. The way things two weeks ago, Shelton's on mm -hmm. fire. Yeah. Now he's cold. Mm -hmm. Pujols on fire, mm -hmm. still oh, on fire. How about, how about Albert Pujols? I, I, can still, he, he's still hot, I yeah, think. Can he establish <laughs> himself? I still don't think this guy gets the credit that he deserves. They're starting he's to walk him. 29 RBIs now, and yesterday again we saw the walk-off double to win it. This guy, if, if anyone is going to win the Triple Crown, it's this <laughs> yeah, guy. Absolutely. I, I think he can do it this year. I'm serious. I think he's going to do he's it. He's so young, too. He is, he's, he's, he's so, so young. good. <laughs> Look, another guy, though, that no one's been talking about, Miguel Tejada is batting 426 right yeah. now. 426 in the middle and going on to May. That's nice to have good. his average instead of uh, Alex Gonzalez. <laughs> yeah. right now, huh? We could dream, yeah. Another guy who's tearing the cover off yeah. the ball, Morgan. Ensberg hitting 400. You have two yeah. guys hitting 400 right on now. On the other side of the ball, though, on the defensive side, a guy that no one's been talking about, Greg Max is 4-0 with a .99 yeah. ERA. Yeah. 
the professor bat. is 40 the years guy's old. like 86. <laughs> And he still strikes out guys. Yeah. Yeah. With an 84 mile an hour fastball, he's still striking people out. So Greg Maddox looking good. He's the ace of their staff. Cliff's the ace of our staff. <laughs> but right now we're gonna have to go to commercial guys. When we come back, the NBA playoffs. We, you know, do what I've always wanted in a, at a college TV station. Come to UVC TV 19 where you can learn how to use all of our equipment. UVC is awesome because we offer workshops that train our members in all aspects of TV production. UVC's got a great sports department for a lot of opportunities for our members. UVC is great because it's run for students and by students. The skills the students learn at Union Video Center would be applicable to any job in the telecommunications field. Students building students doing students things. So what are you waiting for? Come visit us online to find out more information about how you can join UVC TV 19, UMass's only student-run TV station. Hello, welcome back to UMass Sports Weekly. Danny Exter now joining Clifford Shock and myself, Nick DeFelice. What's happening? Guys, this is probably the favorite segment of the UVC fans. Stop <laughs> making us blush, you know, giving us all this pressure, putting it on us, making us just stop it. Um, <laughs> I'm, about to, I'm about to drop the steak bone and just let you two fight <laughs> over it. But guys, let's talk about it. Phoenix, LA Lakers, it, yep. it came in with the hype. Yep. Kobe on fire. The MVP now, Nash. So Kobe, well deserved. Kobe well deserved, doesn't definitely. win the MVP. How mad was he last he, night? He in the looked Phoenix a little game? mad last night. Him and Nash almost got into it. But what the Lakers are doing, my coach Mike D'Antoni, as we said last week, said that he would let Kobe do whatever <coughs> he wants. Well, with Kobe doing whatever he wants, he's actually distributing the ball and he's playing a team basketball game right now, buying into Phil Jackson's complete triangle offense system right now. The Lakers are pounding the ball down to Kwame Brown and Lamar Odom, and Phoenix has absolutely no interior defense to defend that. Phoenix only scored 93 points last night on great Laker defense, and Kobe Bryant's picking his spots where he could take the game over, as we saw last night, making big shots down the clutch. And you, you saw Odom, you saw Kwame Brown, you saw Smush Parker. Lakers are in control of this series right now, tied 1-1, heading back to Phoenix, heading back to LA. All right, my response to that is Kobe Bryant is not gonna shoot 50% night in and night out, and 24 shots for Kobe Bryant is unlikely. The man shoots at least 30 a game. The reason why he shot 24, because he was making half of them, that's number one. Number two, Sean Marion only had 13 points, shot five for 15. That is very uncharacteristic of Sean Marion. He is the second scorer on that team. He's gotta produce more, had an off night. That's why the Lakers probably came away with this have game you, a lot more easily. Well, who's covering Marion? Is it have, Odom? Yeah. Have you been watching the series, Danny? Yeah, I've been have watching, you've been the, watching series. the series. You want, okay, Sean Marion is getting, he can, he cannot do anything. To, he's getting beat up down low against Odom and against well, It's very Kwame. tough when it's 6'10 against that, about 6'7. That's seven. what I'm saying. He's getting yeah. beat up down low and he's getting so tired. If you let so me, when he goes if you over let the me, If you let end. me finish my argument, which I'll let you finish your argument, then we can be cool here. So Raja Bell also, here's a guy that has about 23 points. Raja Bell. Whoever expected Raja Bell to have 23 points? If he's gonna have, if he's gonna have that kind of a night, that's another scoring threat against the Lakers. So watch out if he keeps keeps it going. And not only that, Tim Thomas. This is a guy that I should have mentioned the first time that we started about this argument because Tim Thomas is a lifetime double-figure scorer. And if Tim Thomas can light it up, maybe average about 15, to 18 points in this series. That's about another third, maybe even fourth Danny, scoring option Danny, for this Tim team. Thomas, you, just asked, much you just asked. Tim Thomas to be a deciding factor in this series. Who is the big this is a guy. Who is the player for every team in the NBA? Whoa. This is a guy. Veteran, who is, I'll give you that. Who is the is big three? Who was one of the key parts of the big three during Milwaukee when they were with their glory days? It was Glenn Robinson, Sam Vassell, and Tim Thomas. The Bucks, glory the Bucks days. were a dominant team in the East maybe four or five years ago. <laughs> Okay. They were. First of all, first of all, they lost in the conference finals, and Tim Thomas what, maybe averaging 12 points a game that series. Second of all, you just asked Tim Thomas to be a deciding factor in his Lakers Sun series. All right, guys, but I don't we mean have to a break. phone call. I'm sorry. I don't mean to break you up, guys. I'm sorry. I believe we have a phone call. Caller, are you there? Are you listening? Do you want these two to keep fighting? Hello, caller, are you there? Hello. Hello. Caller. Hello. Hey. Hello. Hey, caller, How's it going? We don't know if no. we're uh, right. through yet. <laughs> But um, anytime we do, if that caller calls back, um, you know we'll Hello? get you right on the air. We promise. But um, let's talk, let's go back to this. You, you got Tim Thomas. Hello? Who you're talking about? Sean Marion, Steve Nash. We a lot of people are saying Nash shouldn't be the MVP. Mm. He lost too many people. But now, if you take away Marion from Nash, I think that Phoenix offense is shut oh, down. Here we go. Oh, call are you there? Hello? Who's Hello? this? Who's this? Hey guys, this is Larry. Larry, you haven't called in like two years. Where you been? Uh, well, the show hasn't been on at its normal time. Oh, oh, we've been announcing on. it, man. I, I'm used to having the show on, on Sunday. Oh, okay. Uh, so sorry, we, we made I a little... I guys tonight, and I'm glad. We had I to talk to the networks and switch it around. 
Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, it wasn't really our call, but we're talking about NBA right now. You got any thoughts about the uh, East or West playoffs? Well, I heard that uh, it got leaked that Nash is going to be named uh, the MVP yep. again this season. And I think, uh, what do you think Phoenix's chances of beating L.A. is? And if they were to... Uh, Say if the Lakers were to win the series, then they'd be going up against the winner of the uh, the Clippers and uh, Nuggets. Yep. Nuggets series, mm. which is uh, so I don't know what you what do you guys think about well, that matchup? Well, first of all, well first of all, that matchup would be crazy. I, I would love, love to see matchup. the Lakers play the Clippers in the second round because that would be an all Staples Center matchup. Yeah. You know, it would be the uh, no home court, no home There's court no advantage, home court basically. Advantage. And so yeah, uh, going back to Larry's point though, do you, do you think Kobe can carry this now that Nash has been leaked as the MVP? Larry, thank you for the phone call. Great question though. Think Steve about this. Nash is the MVP for a reason. Lose big scores like Joe Johnson, Quentin Richardson, Omari Stoudemire. Omari Stoudemire is gone. Replace him with guys like Boris Diaw, um, Brian Eddie, Grant, Eddie House, Eddie House Leandro Barbosa. Barbosa. Guys who were no names, average maybe five, six points a game. Bar I've heard that um, Boris Diaw could be leaked as most improved player I've heard rumors of. So Nash is doing Nash is doing something to make Leonardo Barbosa and to make Boris Diaw better players. Every single game that Steve Nash played this year, didn't play this year, it's four of them, the Phoenix Suns lost by 20 plus points. And believe Nick, we have another caller on the line right now. I know, this is, phone's ringing off the <laughs> hook today. So caller, if we can get you on the line, um, you know, we'll talk to you. Caller, are you there? Yeah, Hello. Hello. Hello, caller. Hello, uh, it's Vince. Who's this? Vince. Vince, how you doing? Good, how are you? Good. We're talking about uh, NBA playoffs right now. Well, first of all, I just want to say what a great show. Thank you, Thank you very you. much. We appreciate it. All right, my question is, since you guys know a lot more about, about basketball and sports than me, I was wondering what your predictions about the Western Conference semifinals were. Western Conference semifinals, guys. Well, I think, I think in the one bracket, it's going to be, I, I still am going to say it. I said it last week. The Lakers are going to win this series against the Suns. Mm -hmm. They've got them figured out. They know how to play the defense. The Lakers are going to win that series, and the Clippers are just going to absolutely run away now with Kenny Martin suspended for the Nuggets. It's going to be the Lakers and Clippers in one bracket. Dallas is just pouring it on against Memphis. Memphis cannot do anything to stop that team against basically a quadruple-headed monster right now. So it's going to be Dallas, and the Spurs are just going to take care of Sacramento so now. Let's, so let's pick two teams. I think Western it's going to be – well, this Western Conference semifinals, he was yeah. asking. So it's going to be oh. the Lakers against the Clippers, uh, Lakers against Clippers, and then Dallas against the Grizzlies. Oh, well, I, I mean Dallas against the Spurs. Yeah, me. right. So I think you have against. You have. I agree for the most part, but in the sense where we we in where we're different is that I have Phoenix beating L. A. So then I have therefore Phoenix and the Clippers. Yep. Then you have Dallas, and well, I agree with that. You have the San Spurs. Antonio. Dallas, absolutely. Those are yeah. two powerhouses that I think it's going to take absolutely seven games to go for. But think about the matchups we could have. We could have an intercity yep. matchup, yep. and we could have an interstate yep. matchup. Yep. That would be good for the NBA in a sense that the NBA. state. The, the attendance will be through the roof, yep. but the rest of the country, I think it's uh, going to ruin it. I don't know, I though. think if you, got, if you have Phoenix now, out in Denver, those are two favorite teams in the nation. But any time you got Kobe Bryant in a series, people wow. are going to tune I also want to know, when was the last time that the Clippers were, were in the we're playoffs good. in general? We're good. Years ago, eight right, years ago. so I mean, to see a, a team that has been in the cellar, that has been in lottery lotteries, uh, the lottery of one to five, you know, picking in the draft, and to see them, you know, go this far, even talking about it in conversations, is just unbelievable. I think that does a lot of, for the NBA to see. Here's a bottom seller dweller team, yep. and now they're being talked about making it to the Western yep. Conference semifinals. Absolutely. All right, Absolutely. guys, so two great phone calls today. We thank uh, Larry and Vince. Call us if you're out there, 51336. Call us. We'll talk to you about uh, NBA playoffs. But, guys, let's move it to the East. East, yep. The West has been great as well, but the East also. Let's, oh, let's East, talk about it. You know, they got uh, some interesting matchups tonight. Miami going into Chicago tonight. I think Chicago might get that game tonight at home. Miami still has not had an answer for Chicago's perimeter offense so far in this series. Chicago shooting about 50% lights out from the three-point line with Luol Deng, Kirk Heinrich, and Ben Gordon doing a great job. Chicago's been in it both games in Miami. They just haven't had the opportunity to, you know, uh, stop Miami down the stretch. But I think with their home crowd behind them tonight, they'll be able to get a win. Well, Cliff, likewise, with the Heat not being able to stop the perimeter of the Bulls, the Bulls haven't been able to stop the interior of the Heat. Shaq has just been able to have his way. You have Mike Sweetney guarding up on Shaq. I mean, that's just a huge mismatch. Anytime you have a guy that's 7-1 on a guy that's 6-8, you're bound to see dominance, especially when his name is Shaquille yeah. O'Neal. So, I mean, it's just going to be interesting to see. I mean, the Bulls really have to shoot lights up to balance out the, you know, the weakness that they have over in the interior. I mean, 
I'm obviously not going to have Tyson Chandler match up on Shaq because Tyson's just way too weak and just has no kind of muscle on him yeah. where, you know, Sweeney is yeah. a thick guy that has some muscle on him. Well, at least tall enough, obviously. Exactly. And they can't afford to so, get Chandler in a foul. No, right? because Chandler is their really only legit yeah, scoring option Yeah, you saw the Bulls were making a run in game two there and Tyson Chandler fouled out. They had, they had nothing down the yeah. stretch yeah. there. That, that's the one, two, well, the one, two, three punch. Goes, yeah. It goes through Gordon. It goes through Heinrich. And it goes through Dan. No Chio. Uh, the guy that really has been an X factor. The guy that's been an X factor game Chicago one. Bulls that even keeps them in these games. I think you know what you get from Dang, from Heinrich, from Gordon. But this guy, Nocioni, has really, I believe, what is the second or third year in the league? Second year. Second yeah, year. Yeah. Just European, really, yeah. really a European guy, just really, and physical, playing physical, where you have that European stereotype of, you know, basketball, those basketball players being weak. This guy is strong, plays hard, plays intense. He really has been an X factor in my mind as to why the Bulls are even in contention of, yeah. you know, giving the Heat a run for their well, money. They're still down 2 0, but Nocioni in game one scored yeah. 30 points. Oh, yeah. This came out of nowhere. Well, I both mean, games were close. The both games, the Chicago. Chicago Bulls have been right there. And now behind their home crowd tonight, I think the Bulls will get a win. We'll see what I happens. I think that the Bulls have to get out to a lead early. Another yeah. team that's down two others in action tonight, Denver. Can they pull one out? No, uh, Denver's done. Denver's done. Whether they win tonight or whether they don't win tonight, they're absolutely done. Sam Cassell is just leading the charge to that Los Angeles Clippers team. And right now, how much, how many internal problems can the Denver Nuggets have right now? Kenny Martin suspended for an indefinite amount of time. Looks like he's done. Now the Clippers, uh, now the Nuggets are probably going to try to trade him. But with Brand down low and Cayman down low, I know he's banged up a little bit, sprained his ankle the other day in practice should be playing tonight the interior presence for this Clippers team with the ability to kick it out to outside shooters such as Sam Cassell and Katino Moby and Vladimir Radmanovich this Clipper team has established that Denver Nuggets have no answer for these guys they can't play them down low the only one played basically playing well in this series so far has been Marcus Camby Carmelo Carmelo has been nowhere Boykins has been, has been nowhere Denver has absolutely no offensive answer they can't stop De uh, it's LA down watching, low. De watching Denver on offense is almost as painful as sitting next to you every day <laughs> once a week uh, once a week, all right? It's I just mean, extremely <laughs> painful because you see Denver and how Carmelo Anthony is just being absolutely shut out. Yep. Who's going to step up? Kenny Martin has do done two games. Like he's this and he's had a great Kenny. series. And yeah, he's had, he's had but a good you know series, what? If, if, you have to have Carmelo and Canby on the same page. And you can't you, have yeah. one, you know, one or the other. It's either both or none cool. because the, the team's just not good enough to have, you know, somebody else outside of yeah. those two step up. Yeah, Canby's going to give you offense and defense. And Carmelo's going to give you offense on a little bit of defense. But you need Earl Boykins. Yeah. You need a point guard on this team. Andre Miller. Andre somebody Miller, yep. to step it up and just distribute the ball. And without that, if they go down 3-0, it's, it's over. Just, it's just that, that interior presence for the Clippers. The Nuggets have absolutely no answer for that. Chris Kamen and, and Elton Brandon both just too big, too wide, and too strong. And when you have a guy like Sam Cassell on your team who knows how to win championships and makes big shots at the end of the games and who wants, who craves the ball, who needs the ball at the end of the games, your team's going to be in trouble. But you know yeah. what it is, too, is that Carmelo... Anthony is shooting a terrible percentage. He can't get anything going. And then when you have, like we said in the beginning, I said Brand is really dominating inside. One of the better power forwards in the league, I think. Casella has just been a gold mine over there for the Clippers. McGetty's playing great coming off the bench. Yep. Everything is just going the right way for, in Clipperland. Yeah, McGetty hitting, what, a half-court shot yeah. there, right? <laughs> but uh, I think Coach Dunleavy's doing a great oh, job. The way job. he is yep. managing his troops. Cayman and Brand, this is new for them. Oh, yeah. Cassell, nothing new for him at yeah. all. But he was McGetty, of course, has played on a bunch and of different Moby players. I well. really thought Dunleavy was going to possibly win Coach of the Year. I mean, I really think that the way you he turned... You got to Avery Johnson, though. If you let me finish. Obviously, you got to give it to Avery Johnson because he's taken that team and made them a defensive team. That Mavericks team never, ever played defense with Don yeah. Nelson under the helm. And then, but to argue with the Clippers, he has a coach that came from, you know, retirement, and then he goes and takes the Clippers, and now they're, you know, being talked about Western Conference yeah. semifinals, and you know? finals even. And yeah. finals even. Yeah. So it's, it was interesting, but obviously Avery Johnson does deserve it. Avery Johnson, he, I definitely agree with you guys. He deserves it. But there's a lot of candidates up there. Of course, there's other coaches, other teams doing great things. But look at the list of Avery, people Avery Johnson on the list with Larry Bird. I believe there's some other great uh, yeah. in their rookie year winning coach of the yeah, year. That sure. doesn't happen much. Oh, Doc Rivers yeah. also on that list with, in Orlando. In Orlando. So, um, you know, your Orlando Magic. Sure. Not the big, who I noticed, they didn't make the playoffs. They, the playoffs. Yeah, they oh. gave a run, though. They gave they it a run, of course, around. last week, Danny. And then, Danny putting, was it money? Did <laughs> no you put money, money. I said, no I said money. I'd take him out to dinner if the Magic <laughs> made the playoffs, but thankfully I wanted to see It was close. It was tight. Table. It was very tight. Chicago just really won down the stretch, and that's yeah. what knocked him out.
So um, yeah, one of course. other game tonight, though, and this series, the Nets and Pacers series, now tied at one, heading back to Indiana. Pedro Siakovic is out tonight with a right knee injury, but this this series has gone to a little bit of a verbal battle. Vince Carter coming up huge in Game Two, scoring 33 points, but Anthony Johnson, as well as a couple other Stephen Jacksons on the Pacers, taking some verbal jabs at the Nets, saying that well, Carter shouldn't really be acting the way he is because everybody knows he's not tough. So a lot of words from the Pacers, especially the ex-Net Anthony Johnson. So the table is set for a big physical matchup tonight in Indiana. Here's the thing about the Pacers, though, is that when you had Jermaine O'Neal and Pager going, you know, perfect compliments for each other, that's a tough team to beat. Now it just puts more pressure on Jermaine O'Neal, which we're not really sure if he can handle that or not. Then you look at the Nets, Vince Carter can be a dominant player if he stopped taking so many fadeaways and just really took it to the hole a lot more, which I think he did a lot better in that second game. First game we saw he shot the ball a yep. lot of times, a lot of it was forcing, really fading away, but I think Vince Carter so dominant, really, Nobody can really guard him to perfection on that Pacer team in a sense where Vince can really take over the team, go to the hole, shoot free throws, and hey, don't forget you have a guy named Richard Jefferson on the yep. team also who's quite the scorer as well. You know, I had you do it with the West, not to cut you off, but so let's pick them in the East. Let's pick the semifinals as, um, I think, as we did with well, the West. I think the Nets will ultimately win this series. It's going to be a struggle for them, especially against this physical Pacer That's going team. Seven. And then I really play. think it's going to go seven, and then they're going to advance as well, and Miami. then they're going to play the, I, the winner of the Cleveland-Washington series, which I still think is going to be Cleveland, even though Washington had a great bounce back Ten win the LeBron. other day. Ten yeah, turnovers right. for LeBron, but you know what? He, he, he's a professional. He's young. He's no, he can. Be, we've seen him bounce back from bad games before, and then Miami's going to win, and Detroit's going to win. So it's going to be Detroit against Cleveland, in my opinion, and then Miami against New Jersey, and that's going to be a really fun series to watch. Again, Cliff, I'm going to go three out of the four and say it's going to be Washington in, in New Jersey, and then I'm going to say Washington it's De and Detroit. In Detroit. I'm sorry, Washington and Detroit, and then New Jersey and Miami. All right, good, not bad. Whoever faces Detroit's done. Doesn't, <laughs> yeah. It really doesn't matter. They're, they're right so now dangerous. Cle yeah, team Cleveland and Washington are playing the chance to get yeah. killed. But, but you, you know, I'd just like to see LeBron James get a first round series victory. You know, we, we want to see the development of this guy. We saw a new commercial campaign by Nike. We are all witnesses. Yeah. Well, right now, let's hope we can all witness LeBron James' first round series I just uh, really victory. think that Washington has way too much firepower. They have the highest scoring trio in the NBA with Gilbert Arenas, Antoine Jameson, and Karan Butler. That's a dangerous trio right there. They don't play defense. Right they don't play defense. And LeBron James plays defense. They have defense. nobody down low. LeBron James plays defense too. <laughs> okay. All right, guys, we're going to have to wait and see how that series turns out of course tied 1-1 and that game going back to Cleveland but um, I'm not sorry I'm not back to Washington yes. is it yeah yep. back to Washington. Washington but um, right now we're gonna go to commercials when we come back we'll catch you up to date with the NHL playoffs and the NFL draft on the horizon <laughs> Hello and welcome back to UMass Sports Weekly. Danny Exter, now Brandon Harms, and myself, Nick DeFelice. Brandon, we welcome you. Great you're to be back on. You're filling the hot seat right now. This is just <laughs> the uh, the dog fight between Shockin and uh, Exter. <laughs> we'll but, see um, what I can do. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna try to we're gonna try to duplicate that for all you fans at home with the NHL. So we're gonna we're gonna throw the ice at you guys, see if it cools you down at all. But uh, let's go right into the NHL, guys. Uh, some of your 
let's go with some of your uh, matchups, featured matchups between the two of you, or big things in the East and West that are happening. Uh, starting with you, Brandon. You go first. All right. Well, uh, my two featured matchups are the eight one. Normally, you see the ones romp all over the number eight seeds, but here you have the Senators leading the Tampa Bay Lightning, the defending champs, two to one. And you have the Edmonton Oilers leading the Detroit Red Wings, the prohibitive favorite, two to one. So uh, I don't know. Just looking at these two series, you normally see eight seeds getting a little bit of steam once they think that they have a chance to win. And both these teams, the Lightning and the Oilers, have a chance to win these series. I think I think Ottawa's the best team in the NHL. Mm -hmm. And is it the sh they're playing the Sharks? Who? No, Ottawa's playing Tampa Bay. Ottawa's playing Tampa, Tampa Bay, Lightning. defending champs. So. That's what it is. So Tampa Bay's got their hands full, but it's turned out to be a decent series. Well, matchups that are catching my eye over in the West is the Avalanche and the Stars. The Avalanche are up 3-0. You know, and here are the Dallas Stars that have quite the tradition of excellence of winning. They've won Stanley Cups, you know, in, in the past. They've had a good track record, but they just have awful, awful goaltending right now in terms of the Dallas Stars. Marty Turco's playing absolutely terrible, giving up about five goals a game. I mean, here's a guy that was in talks of being one of the better goalies in the league and you're giving a five goals a game. It doesn't sound like a good goalie to me. And then the reason why the Avalanche are really doing so well and are up 3-0 is that there's a guy in net who's doing the opposite of Marty Turco, and his name is um, Jose Theodore, who's kind of looking like, looking like a guy named, Pat, named Patrick Waugh standing in that net, really barely even giving up anything, just playing solid in goal, doing a real great job. And then we're going to go swing over to the East, the Devils and the Rangers. The Devils are up 3-0. And here are the Rangers, the surprise in the East, big time, with Yarmir Yager stepping into that team, helping the Rangers become to the, glorify, to the glory days that they were back in 96. Playoff favorites, and now they're playoff duds. Just absolutely doing, making no noise over there in the playoffs. You have Henrik Lindquist giving up about five goals a game. Then in terms of the Devils, Mario Brodeur look, looking like the, the man has not aged in years, just playing like an absolute stud over in goal. All right, guys. Yeah. Go. Now, but uh, you mentioned though those two series are both three nothing. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at I'm looking at series that could go seven games. Both of the eight one matchups could go seven games. And another thing to note: the Tampa Bay Ottawa. They averaged a total of eight goals per game in each of their three playoff games. That, that's some high scoring well, offense. Well, you know, granted, those are great games, but these games right here are more of like the upsets, right? These are the yeah. surprises that are Is happening it? right now. You we all thought the UBC thought the we Rangers, all thought that was going to be a great series. Rangers and Devils would be true, great, and yeah. then the Avalanche and the Stars, two of the dominant teams yeah. in the West. Both of those teams are up three nothing. That was really never said to yeah, happen. I, telling me the two teams were going to be down 0 oh, three, I'd say, okay, cool. Who? I didn't think it was going to be the Rangers no and the way. Stars, but. Um, all right, guys, uh, let's pick a conference semis quickly uh, for the uh, NHL. Um, well, let's see. I, I like Carolina out of the East. Um, they're, losing, they're currently up on Montreal 2-1 to one in their series. But uh, and the, over out West, I still like Detroit, even though that the Oilers are leading their series. I, I think those two are still going to match up in the finals. I mean, if the, if the Rangers, I mean, if the Devils keep it up like this, Mario Brodeur keeps having the kind of, kind of playoff series that he is, the Devils could easily possibly come out of the East with that kind of goaltending. And who, what was your pick they said in the West? You had the Oilers? Uh, still the Red Wings. The I got to stay with them, yeah. I mean, the Red Wings have quite the core over there. And I mean, if, it, if there's somebody out in the West, it probably could be Detroit. All right, guys. Let's go down now to the NFL draft, getting all the attention in the world. But there's one guy getting a lot of attention in the world, Reggie Bush, guys. Recently found out there might be a problem with the house that he received that his mother's been living in recently. So, um, I mean, does that affect his draft status at all, Danny? I mean, here's just an interesting situation where Reggie Bush obviously is not going back to college. He's declared himself for the draft. So this kind of steer clears of something that would happen to Reggie Bush directly. What it could affect is that it could affect USC because the Pac-10 is now absolutely going to investigate USC. And, I mean, Pac-10 could lose their championship that they, that they had just won. Not only that, Bush might very well have the Heisman taken away from him if they find out that he was taking money from a marketing firm. I mean, it's not going to ruin his draft stats because he is by far one of the best athletes in the draft right now. But I mean, it could have hurt his, his status outside of the field in the sense of his college and his personal awards. Yeah, you mentioned it there. It will not absolutely, will, absolutely will not affect his status as the number one pick to the Houston Texans. Um, the Texans front office has been very pleased with Reggie Bush during this whole like sort of controversy thing because he's pre presented a united front. He's saying, I've done nothing wrong. Just keep investigating me, whatever. Bring it on. I'll you know what? It. I saw Reggie Bush recently last night. He was on Colin O'Brien and really presented himself well and maturely and saying, hey, you know what? We're taking care of this. There's no truth behind it. Whatever's happening, we're going to take care of it. And right now, he's just focused on being the number one, uh, number one pick in this upcoming draft. 
All right, fans, if we have any draft experts out there, we got our two draft experts right here. But if we have any draft experts out there that uh, would like to call in and talk to us about the draft, we got five minutes left in our show. Let's go five, one, three, three, six, call in, pick your top five or anybody you think is likely to fall. But guys, right now I ask you two to uh, give me a top five. Who's going to take what? Who's going to look for what? You want to start I'll, first? I'll go All first. Right, go so, for so for the number one overall pick, we have the Houston Texans, Texans taking Reggie Bush. We have the Saints taking DeBrickishaw Ferguson. They just got a star-studded quarterback in Drew Brees, so you got to keep your quarterback up on his feet, and that's where they get DeBrickishaw Ferguson. Tennessee, Matt Liner gets reunited with his old offensive coordinator, Norm Chow. The Jets have no emergency quarterback outside of Chad Pennington. That's why it only makes sense they take Vince Young. Green Bay needs a leader on defense. They got their leader on defense back, and, and Brett Favre, who said he will be coming back for this season, so they take A.J. Hawk. All right, well, the only th the th we, we agree on three, one, three, and five, but I'm going to talk about number two. What about Mario Williams? This guy That's is a beast. Yeah, oh, yeah. This guy, is, is, this guy is the next Julius Peppers, and he will greatly influence the, the front. Oh, there we go. We just added an S there, Mario Williams. Um, and what about the Jets? There's a reason why the Jets have had a quarterback problem, and that's because they can't protect them. You saw how many times Chad Pennington got knocked around. DeBrickishaw Ferguson will step right in and fix those problems. All right, guys, so out of these two quarterbacks that we see up there, you have Leinart and Young. Who is better fit to start right now, and who's better fit to be under the arm of, say, a Steve McNair that's, uh, with that's the Titans? That's so hard. To, uh, oh, it looks like we have a call, Nick. Uh, caller, uh, we're talking about the NFL draft. Uh, caller, are you there? I just got a question. Uh, who do you think the Jets should pick? I really, do, I really believe that the Jets are probably going to take Vince Young. Outside of Chad Pennington, there really is no quarterback over there in New York. You have Brooks Bollinger. Oh, there's, it's obvious. That right. Not I mean, up. Jay Thieler was cut and let go. If Chad Pennington goes down with another injury, which has been consistent the last two years, then the Jets could be in a heck of a lot of trouble. Vince Young, it, to me, is the obvious pick because if Chad does go down, here's a winning, ready quarterback ready to step right in. Don't be surprised, though, if the Jets decide to trade up. They have the four, and they also have the 29. And that might look awful, awful appealing to the New Orleans Saints at number two. So look for them also to maybe move, make a move up. Mike, you still there? Yeah. What do you think about Matt Liner? Well, I was, was going to ask you, who do you think is a better suited quarterback in New York? Is it Bush or is it Liner? I mean, I think it's probably going to have to be, I think Vince Young is really going to be a better fit in terms of the media of New York because the media of Texas and the media of New York, those are two major media firms right there. So, I mean, you have him coming from Texas to New York. I mean, it's different in some ways, but in same in the sense that those are guys that have medias that are always in their face, that are always pressuring them. I could really see Vince Young making a nice fit yeah, over Mike, New York. Yeah, Mike, who would you rather have as a Jets quarterback? I don't know. I don't even know if I would take a quarterback. I, first, if I was a Houston Texans, I wouldn't take Bush first. You wouldn't take you Bush wouldn't first. Take Who Bush would you take? The best, the best athlete, the best athlete that we have seen in a long time, especially for a, the worst offense in the NFL. They wouldn't take the most prolific offensive player out of college. Wouldn't take him. You don't start a team with a running back. Uh, that's true. I mean, what but he it does. He, does, he says you don't start a team with a running back. Yet. But um, uh, running but, backs are easy to come by. You you want to start your team with a defense. But, but he's a running back. Draft. He's a wide receiver. He's yeah. a kick returner. This he's is no just, ordinary running he back. He does yeah. multiple. But I mean, if a guy, if you, if you gave the guy a chance to play safety, I'm sure he would go and try his best at it. He's so a you, guy that's just a pure athlete that plays three positions. Start your. You have the worst offense. You have a struggling quarterback. Give that struggling quarterback a target and draft him. So Mike, you're saying Houston should probably take Young. I would trade the pick. Trade the trade pick. The wow. pick. That, that makes sense. And to I mean, some extent, they they need a bunch of trade the pick to help for a bunch more in. picks, maybe some veterans or what? Yeah, trade the pick, four picks. Reggie Bush is not going to do it for the Houston Texans. Yeah, the Texans have a lot of trouble. Mike, we thank you for your call. Uh, keep tuning yeah, no in problem. to uh, UMass Sports Weekly. We Thanks appreciate a lot, Mike. It. Thank you. All right, guys, not too much time left here on our show, but we uh, we appreciate the phone call, Mike. But guys, let's go back to this. The the, uh, the liner Young option. Who's better suited to be under somebody's arm and who's better suited to be a starter? I mean, it's so hard because these are two different kinds of quarterbacks right here. You have more of a pocket passing quarterback in Matt Liner. Then you have more of an athletic scrambling quarterback in Vince Young. It's just, very, I mean, I think anywhere they go in Tennessee, if Young or Liner go there, I think they're going to succeed because they have a great offensive coordinator there in uh, Norm Chow. And if they go to the Jets, I mean, Chad Pennington really can't stay healthy so it'll be interesting to see because these guys might just have to step in right away. Vince Young. Vince Young used his athleticism to win Texas a national championship mm -hmm. and I, I don't know I just see I just see Tennessee maybe 
been doing a great fit, but I, I like I like Vince Young in Oakland the most. I think I think he'll be great that there in the, the long term. That could be the farthest he drops. It's number seven yeah. in Oakland. All right, speaking of dropping, very quickly, guys, who we've been talking about the top five, who's very likely to fall? I mean, we have Dallas at the 18th pick, but Jerry Jones and Bo Parcells have been known to take that pick, to shop it around, to go up and down in the draft, especially since the Cowboys have a dire need at safety slash cornerback. I can see them maybe trying to get Jason Allen, who's the safety slash cornerback out of Tennessee. Big, fast, athletic guy. He could be gone in the top 10. Cowboys, of course, are at 18. So it'll be interesting to see how they shuffle up, if they do shuffle up at all. I think, I think Ernie Sims might fall, the guy from Florida State. This guy's had five concussions in his college career. That's, that's a big deal when you're trying to draft a high-profile NFL All right, guys, player. of course, the draft right around the corner. When it happens, we will have the results for you guys as well. But that's going to do it for this week of UMass Sports Weekly. I thank Danny Exter, Brandon Harms, um, everybody else that's been on air today, Clifford Shockett, Rory Hart, Amir Norman, Jen Driscoll, Evan Levine, TJ Grimm, Kirk Thorne, Dave Beer. We thank you. Thanks to all of you because without you guys, we're not on the air. But that's going to do it for this week of UMass Sports Weekly.